So David, what has been one of your most exciting adventures and moments along this journey? <laughs> That's a hard question to answer for you, I'm sure. Well, there was certainly the excitement of opening Rex and having such a life-changing moment. Um, you know, six months earlier, a year earlier, I was reading thousand page leases and, you know, trying to stay awake. As and a now, lawyer. yeah. And now we had this, you know, wildly hot nightclub. But I think the most fun and the most danger were the same thing. We, we opened the first as consultants, but we really ended up running it. The first Western style supper club in Moscow after the wall came down. Oh, wow. So we were asked to go to Moscow in 92 to see the space. We kind of thought it was like a ridiculous joke, but might as well go have a look. Take um, the meeting. Take the meeting. And we went to Moscow and this group, this bank had actually secured the best location in all of Russia, like the equivalent of, well, I was going to say 5th and 57th, but more likely the equivalent of, you know, Prince and, and well, where the Mercer is or something. Right. Like <laughs> the perfect night, the downtown night, you know, nighttime destination. It was across the street from the Kremlin across the street from St. Basil's. So our view was of that church dome. And yeah, about a year later, we opened basically the Studio 54 of Russia. They had never had anything like that. Wow. It was actually designed by the people who designed Studio 54. Amazing. And it all came about because they were reading about Rex and they wanted to meet us. They were reading about it on page six and they were like, who are these guys? Right. And someone set up a meeting. I can't even remember who. We went to the meeting very skeptically. We're like, yeah, Whatever. we're going to Russia. And the next thing you know, we were working full, you know, full speed ahead on a project in Moscow. And it was super exciting, but also not without its dangers. Club was bombed. Uh, what? It was bombed on a Sunday morning as sort of a warning from another rival business operator. Oh, my goodness. Business operator. And luckily, no one was in the place, which I think was just a warning shot. But I remember having to call my sister, who was due to come to Moscow to visit and, you know, see what was going on. And I, obviously, I called her like, Five minutes later, said, you can't come and tell me if this shows up on CNN because there were news cameras everywhere. Oh, my goodness. And I was so worried that my mom was going to see it and, like, freak out. Right. We were there for the last coup um, when some senators seized their own Senate building in, I think it was October of 93. And uh, the guys we were working for came to us. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, was, was visiting. Worst day of her life because it was the day she arrived. Uh, and, uh, we, without knowing it, we saw the last changing of the garden history of Lenin's tomb because the war broke out a half hour later. And when we got back to the hotel and they told us there was a war going on, we're like, what were we were just in red square five minutes ago. We are like, it's at the radio station. They've seized all the communications. They're marching on the Kremlin. Yeltsin's helicopter proceeds to like immediately like lift off and fly off with that, with two like attack helicopters near it. Oh my goodness. And we woke up um, the next, well, first of all, they gave us wine, pasta, water, and a gun and locked us in our rooms and said, don't answer your door for anyone except us when we come get you tomorrow morning. And when we woke up, there were, there were snipers and, and attack helicopters all on our roof because they were going to use our hotel as the staging ground if they had to take back the Kremlin from the, from the rioters. It was out of a movie. The yeah, I'm going to say that's straight out of it. It was out of a movie. So you guys got out of it. We did. Uh, they made me, actually, interestingly, they, they took us to another location because they were concerned. We had gotten so much press as being, you know, the Americans are here. And it was a very anti-American, pro-communist moment, the last sort of gasp of communism. So they took us out of town to some, like, tiny town in a little motel. And then two days later, we were finally able to get flights, but they made me stay, which was they weren't so so smart about some things, but they were brilliant about other things. And this is where I would never have thought of this. I said, why do you want me to stay? I'll go home to New York. And as soon as you get word that the curfew is lifting, because there was a 9 a.m., 9 p.m. curfew imposed, I said, I'll just come back the next day. And they're like, nope, we want you here. So we want to be able to open the moment the curfew lifts, because people are going to be going insane, locked in their houses for three or four weeks. And so sure enough, they got word that two days later, the curfew was going to, you know, end. it was about a month for me. And we reopened the night that it was lifted and the place was, you know, it was like New Year's Eve because people had been locked in their homes for three or four weeks. Wow. So, yeah, but I was bored out of my mind because, you know, 
There was nothing to really do in Russia at that time. So I right. did a lot of running, a lot of jump rope, watched a lot of soccer because I couldn't understand the TV and read a lot of books. I was literally like trapped in Moscow. Yeah. Um, okay, the movie's coming because this is... <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So how long did that venue stay open? Uh, it stayed open for many years, but we ran it. Our contract was two years. Towards the end of it, they brought in the guy that was supposed to replace us, the Russian expert that was supposed to replace us. And I told, I, by that time, we we're very close to the actual owners. And I, and I, he called me in his office one day, say, what do you think? And I said, honestly, terrible decision. Worst guy I've ever seen. Oh, he has a great reputation. He worked in the Black Sea, he worked in Sochi. He, you know all these resort areas. I'm like, look, he's a fool and you're going to call us back in six months. You should leave us here for a month and keep searching. Yeah. And he's like, no, we've already decided that. I said, okay, dollar bet. <laughs> no joke. Dollar bet that you're going to call me within the next six months. And I swear to God, five months and two weeks later, we were in back in Moscow, but they had this idiot had killed the vibe. It was such a high end vibe. And he sort of lowered the standard so much and the thought that he was going to make more money yeah. that he just killed the reputation of the club. And a new club, of course, had come along and sort of stolen the fire. Because they and, saw that window of opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, at that time, all these young oligarchs in training, basically, it was a great thing for them because they had a home, ba home court advantage. You know, like our place, Manhattan Express, was almost like Rick's Cafe in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what side of the battle you were on or what you did. Everyone kind of met there. And so this other club sees the moment and we said, look, if we have a party, everyone will come out one night to see us and welcome us back, but that'll be it. They'll still go to that. I said, you need to drop a little bit of money to rename it because the name is now tarnished and redecorate so that people feel like, oh, okay, they really went the extra mile and they weren't willing to do it. So it just sort of devolved over the next five or six years. But the first two years were just remarkable. Like, yeah. The, you know, the amount of money that Russians had to spend and the sort of culture of outspending your neighbor that you see, like, if you go to, I don't know, a club in San Tropez or something like that, it was very much existent in Moscow in 1993. No one wanted to be seen as having less money than the next guy. So that was the arrow. <laughs> it was good for business for us, you know. But like I said, there were definitely, you know, once or once every month or two, something happened that you were like, oh my God, how am I in the middle of this shit? Right. Right. You know, but as a poli sci major in college, it was actually, my last paper was about the Cold War. So it was very exciting for you, for me to be there in the middle of really watching it happen or unravel, you know, if you will. I mean, talking to you here, it's so evident how you've been successful at all of this because it's so innate to you, but I am hearing all of these jewels and nuanced strategic things. And, you know, when you advise someone on their business and you have your fingers on the pulse mm -hmm. of what needs to be done and they don't listen, you, you can tell when thing, which direction. Yeah, look, I would have been, I was been super happy if they had found, we yeah. didn't want to stay like we would have been, but we also were so emotionally invested. It was just a financial thing. It was just an emotional investment. You spent two and a half years of your life working on something. It's not like you just turn it off, you know, like I don't care. So I, I was more for protecting them that we wanted them to pick someone else. It wasn't for our benefit. Right. And, and I get that about you. Yeah, we Man just, I'm like, really I'm like, want to help I, said to, I said, Yuri, this guy's going to kill your business. No, no, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I hated to be, I really did. I hated to be right. right. But in that case, I was right. So t what's one piece of advice that you can share based on your experience with someone looking to enter this space or needing to energize their existing business in hospitality well, or restaurants? If they were looking to enter it, I would suggest that they, not make the mistake we did, which was never working ourselves in the business before we opened a place. Like Will had been a waiter during college and I had a lot of friends in the business and got a lot of advice, but there's no substitute for really running a place for six months or even assisted running a place for six months. And we, we skipped that step and it was a, it was a big mistake for us because we never really had the financial footing and, and, and sort of awareness that we should have had at the launch of Rex. And we, we were always chasing our tail. It took about four months for it to take off till people really understood what was going on there. And that four months really, we never escaped that shadow of, you know, how much money we owed and all that stuff. So it would have been, we were bright enough that if we had spent some time with somebody, we would have picked up on what we, but we definitely just charged in like, we're smart. We know what we're doing. We could do this. And it's not that simple.
So you're saying learn from something. Yeah, it's a, it's a, such a, it's such a margin business. You know, it's, it's, you, you know, you really have to watch everything. You have to, every cost you have to think about because it's just so, it's so, such a tight business. Right. And we weren't uh, as aware as we should have been. So anyone who's thinking about going into it for the first time, that, that would be my suggestion. If someone's, if someone's not doing well right now with an existing business, it's a, that's a much harder, that's a much bigger lift because, you know, it's so hard to find new capital if you're not making money. So right. like if you wanted to go out and say, look, let's, let's renovate, let's rebrand, let's whatever, it's, you really have to find someone who really believes in you. And that's not easy, especially if it's not doing well, like who's going to pour right. good money after bad. So that's a tougher, that's a tougher question. I would probably suggest that they bring in, you know, someone else to work with them who has chops, good you advice. know, or better chops, you know, yeah. or, and, and take a little bit of a back seat, reduce their percentage willingly. I always say to people like, I'd rather own less of a great project than, than more of a shitty project. That is my mantra. You know, there's no reason for some me. Of to... Something is better than some of nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? What's the point of having, you know, 50 or 60% of something that just sucks when I could have 25% of something that's going to last 10 years and Bingo. I don't have to do everything and everyone thinks it's great and it leads to more projects, yeah. you know, because people think, oh, well, that's a, I mean, that's exactly what happened with Skylark. I mean, if Jimmy hadn't been doing so well, I would never have gotten that call. And Success uh, begets success. So I'm willing, I'm always willing to like partner with people that I think are strategically smart and that I like so that it's not all about, cause I don't know everything, you know, and there's no way I could. And so you, you really want, and I don't know all the new, you know, young hotshots moving to town, no way I could. So it's great to have partners that can help you in that process. Amazing. Well, that leads me to my next question. When do you know it's the right time to scale? Um, I don't know that you do. I mean, for, we thought we were, killing it in 2005 when Lotus was, you know, king of the city, if you will. And we did the double seven and we did Los Dados and both made a ton of sense, except our rent at, at double seven was $60 a square feet, a square foot. Apple signed at that when they did the first Apple downtown at 285 a square foot. And then Hugo Boss to be next to Apple signed at 525 a square foot. So all of a sudden our rent was nine times under market. And a, our building went wildly, got wildly valuable and the landlord sold it um, out from under us, even though all our investors were real estate guys and said, this right. will never get sold. This is a shitty building and, you know, no one cares. Right. So, you know, we thought we were being so smart. Same thing. We thought we were being so smart about opening Los Dados. We sort of felt like, well, we control this neighborhood. You know, we have Lotus and Double Seven and I'm the head of the Meatpacking District Initiative, which is now a bid. But at the time, it was just sort of like an unofficial chamber of commerce. I'm like, yeah, we'll crush it if we have it. And at first we did, but then the world fell apart. So I think scaling is obviously what you want to do, but you just have to be aware that, that the world can throw, throw snowballs at you that you're just not expecting. Right. You know, you can make your own mistake too and miscalculate a neighborhood or overestimate how, how you know, you, we haven't really done much of this, but I've definitely seen brands that are super successful in New York and they've gone to other markets and no one cares. Yeah. Uh, we, it happened to us was actually... I think part of it was the space sucked, but we, Jimmy was very successful or is still very successful. And at that time, that hotel group opened a James in Chicago and they wanted to make Jimmy at, instead of a rooftop, they wanted to make it a little speakeasy. And we thought, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And it was a very sexy little room and only holds up fifth, like 50 people. But the, the thing you had to sneak through to get to Jimmy was a bacon and meat shop. And I'm like, this is the <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And we had no control over that. Yeah. I'm like, Make it like a smoothie bar so that, right. and we can share the juices and we can share the fruit and all that stuff. Make it some people actually, but you're going to do a, a bacon based meat bar and people are going to walk through that to get to a high end bar. It was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Plus Chicago, as do many cities, they very justifiably have a, an opinion that they, they don't really need New Yorkers help. They have great right. mixologists. They have great chefs, beautiful restaurants. And so for a little while, we were like the new kid on the block. And then people were like, well, this isn't really necessarily better than our own homegrown place. And so that wasn't, you know, again, it, it was a management agreement. It didn't really, but it, there, you know, there's tremendous value in your time. And so in a lot of ways, we wasted a lot of time 
it felt cool at the time, right? Someone's flying to Chicago and we're eating in all these cool restaurants and we're meeting all these new people. Then I was like, why did we just do that? Right. Like that was a huge I've been there. time suck. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think that that's one of the lessons for me is like, th think about what's not realistic. You know, something may look really great and smart for you to do, but it actually isn't. Right. Like, you know, you can't just necessarily translate your popularity. Like, look, I think American Bar would work really well in Miami, in LA, in maybe Dallas or, or, or maybe even London. But I think if we went to Colorado, you know, to Denver, they'd be like, who cares? Like, yeah. it's just, yeah, that's a good salad. It's a pretty good burger. Who cares? You know, it's, there's, it's a vibe. I think we need to be where people who are already our audience also go. Sure. And they go to, they go to LA a lot. They go to Vegas, they go to Miami and they go to London and Paris. They don't necessarily go to, you know, the middle of the country, right. you know, and you know, so I, 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 if someone came to us and said, we're going to build you a, an American bar in Omaha, I'd be like, eh. or Pittsburgh, like it's a, they're tertiary cities. They're a great idea to go do something good there, but don't think that your vibe from New York is going to follow you to a city like that. Cause it's right. not, 